And since there's just a little bit left, I guess I will finish. Um, the end of criticism, a final dialogue. Question. You've said a great many things about criticism, that it is an art form in its own right, that it exists to enhance the glory of the other arts, that it is an impossible activity, that it is necessary and vital to human self-understanding, that it can never die, that it is in perpetual danger of distinction, mm, extinction. And you have said even more about what criticism is not. It is not mere fault finding or empty praise. It is not just the expression of personal tastes and judgments. It is not science or philosophy or politics or poetry, though at various times it mimics all of those things. But to be frank, I'm still not sure I know what criticism is, unless it is whatever a critic happens to be doing. And in that case, what is a critic? Answer, you've put your finger on it. Criticism is both paradoxical and tautological. It's whatever a critic does, a critic being anyone who is at a given moment practicing criticism. And it is an impossible undertaking that is at the same time impossible to prevent from happening. You might as well try to stop thinking. It can't be done. Question, so we're back where we started. Criticism is thinking. Is it a particular kind of thinking or just whatever a given brain gets up to in the presence of a particular stimulus? Answer, both naturally. But rather than speaking so abstractly, it might be better in the interest of clarity and our own amusement to trace the genesis of a particular critical act. Show me what you've been doing there. Question, doing where? Answer, the drawing you've been making on the back page while I've been talking. Question, it's just a doodle, I'm not really sure. Answer, so much the better. It issues directly from your unconscious and so is rich with accidental beauty and occult meaning. Let me see it. Question, is that a criterion of value then? Something spontaneous or reflexive? Unreflecting, unmotivated, is better than something that required a lot of work and thought? You'd rather look at this offhand sketch than at something I sweated over for hours or days or weeks? Something I undertook after years of struggling to master the appropriate techniques? Or are you just arbitrarily looking for an object so you can practice your critical trickery? Answer, both, naturally. You have nicely identified the foundational act of criticism, which is the selection of an object, the willed decision to look. Your creative intention in this case, whether you thought you were making something worth looking at or just occupying a moment of boredom, is secondary to my intention, which is to scrutinize and judge it. Question. So you can just look at anything, criticize anything, the rug, the window, what's outside it? Answer. Well, yes and no. Anything can be judged, analyzed, investigated, made into a vessel of feeling, meaning, narrative, moral significance, beauty, and so on. But the question is whether the thing in question can bear the scrutiny, which is really to say whether the act of scrutinizing it can be made interesting. Question, but then isn't my drawing irrelevant? It would seem that the only interesting about what it, thing about it is what you have to say. Doesn't that mean that a critic is just somebody who can say something interesting about anything and so get in between that thing and the other people who might be interested in it? Answer, yes and no. Let's say that a critic is a person whose interest can help to activate the interests of others. That's not a bad definition. I should have thought of it before. For that to work, what the critic writes or says has to be interesting to, in itself. And of course, it can only really succeed in that way if the critic's own interest is genuine. I may or may not like your drawing, but it's essential that I care about it. Question, but might your job also be to tell the world that it isn't worth caring about? Surely there are cases when a critic's duty is deflection and deflation. There is so much hype and hyperventilation in the world, so much breathless selling, that someone needs to draw a calm breath or throw cold water or just say, look, it's not that big of a deal. Answer, yes, and we also have the, a duty to redirect enthusiasm, to call attention to what might otherwise be ignored or undervalued. In either instance, though, whether we're cheerleading or calling bullshit, our assessment has to proceed from a sincere and serious commitment. Otherwise, it's empty and reflexive. If I were, let's say, unmoved by any visual art or hostile to the very notion that your doodle could be beautiful or profound, then the only ethical and honest course of action for me would be to remain silent and leave the discussion to others. Question, as if. Answer, I know. That rule is more often honored in the breach than in the, observer, than in the observance. It's amazing how often supposedly critical arguments are launched from the logically and morally untenable assumption that the work in question is categorically unfit for criticism. 
Whole art forms are routinely condemned this way, usually those favored by the young or by the other socially marginal groups, the poor, racial and sexual minorities, and so forth. To look at the record of contempt for jazz, hip hop, disco, rock and roll, video games, comic books, and even television and film is to witness learned and refined people making asses of themselves by embracing their own ignorance. And of course, you can find a symmetrical countervailing bias against what is perceived as difficult or highbrow or snobbish, whether it's abstract art or movies with subtitles or classical music. Whatever criticism is, it is surely the opposite of that kind of performed, unreflecting dismissal. So you have question. So you have said. But doesn't that just reduce criticism to fandom and restrict it to a circle of aficionados, the ones who already get it, and who speak to one another in the coded language of the initiated? Is there no room for a neutral or skeptical or just curious but not necessarily knowing perspective? One that comes from outside the inner circle of the already convinced? Answer. In fact, that's all there's room for. Now let me see your work. Question. Oh, my work. Really, if you insist. Don't laugh, though. Answer. Question. Well, answer. I. Question. Yes. Answer. Is this supposed to be me? Question. Well, it's kind of. Answer. Do my jowls really sag that much? Question. It's more an idea of you, really. I mean, not really you in the literal sense. You were talking, and I just noticed the way your eyes cut sideways when you were looking for the right word, and I just tried to capture that. Answer. Yes, I can see. Question. You hate it. Answer. No, the hairline. Question. Okay, but here's the thing. Let's say it wasn't supposed to be you, and let's say it wasn't drawn by me, or that you didn't know it was by me, or that you didn't know me. Let's say you saw it at a museum. Answer. This? What museum? Question. You know what I mean. Suppose you saw it in a different context. Suppose it was attributed to, I don't know, Degas. <laughs> Answer. Degas. Question. It's a silly little cartoon I drew while you were talking. You said you wanted to look at it, and since you did, and since that's the foundational act or whatever of criticism, I want to know. What are you looking at? How do you make sense of what you see? Do you analyze the formal qualities, the line, the use of negative space, the cross-hatching? Do you compare it to other drawings you've seen, other works by the same artist in the same genre? Do you try to find out what the artist might have been thinking or what kind of person the artist was from what kind of background? Answer, yes, all of that question all of that all of that is going through your head right now or all of that is what you will need to consider as you formulate your um, critique answer I like it question you like it answer it's nice question it's nice that's what the critic has to say answer well you have to start somewhere of course it's very complicated question oh of course you seem Uncharacteristically, I must say, at a loss for words. And isn't that because you're not really sure who you're talking to? You like to say that the essence of criticism is conversation, a passionate, rational argument about a shared experience. But I wonder if you really mean it. I think for you it might be more of a performance, a thing you can only do if there's an audience. And if that's just me, and I also turn out to be the artist, then words might fail you. Or put it another way. You have spent many, many pages chasing after the pure aesthetic encounter, the moment of ecstatic contemplation when context falls away and the beholder and the work find themselves in a state of mutual presence. But isn't that a fantasy? Aren't there always conditions attached? Even when it's just you and me and you're looking at a silly drawing? Answer. Maybe especially then. And maybe, which I think is what you're implying, there's no such thing as private or personal criticism. <laughs> It has to be a public act, something you're invited to do when something is submitted for your approval or disdain. Very little happens in the world without some kind of publicity, without it being known, promoted, hyped, or whatever. So if criticism can be the corrective to that hype, it might also be true that the hype is the precondition for criticism. Question. So if instead of your snatching the doodle out of my hands, I said, hey, take a look at this, tell me what you think. Answer. I might have suggested that if the softness of the jaw was meant to convey an indecisive temperament, the effect is undermined by the determined set of the mouth, and that the eyes are weirdly asymmetrical, as if one were turned inward while the other gazed out at the world with puzzlement and hostility. Though it's quite possible that you were not being inconsistent, but rather trying to capture the contradictions inherent in your subject, and so turn this tossed-off portrait of a critic into an allegory of criticism itself. Question. Now you're just showing off. Answer. 
Well, yes. And trying to save face, as it were. Have you seen the movie Ratatouille? Question. We saw it together. You cried the whole time. Answer. I was moved. It's a movie about the symbiosis between artist and critic. The perfect summation of everything I believe, at once exuberantly democratic and unabashedly elitist, defending good taste and aesthetic accomplishment, not as snobbish entitlements, but as universal ideals. Question. Are you quoting yourself? Answer. Anton Ego, c'est moi. Question. But isn't Anton Ego kind of the villain? Answer. Assurement pas. He is Remy, the rat's secret sharer. Mm. He is Remy the rat's, oh, that's better. He is Remy the rat's secret sharer, the only one who truly understands his genius. Question. Really, though, doesn't Remy just need the publicity that a good review from Ego will provide? The critic may fancy himself a priest of good taste and a champion of high standards, but isn't he at bottom more of a shill? And doesn't Ego's review of the meal Remy cooks at Gusto's lay waste to the whole critical enterprise? The part everyone quotes is about how pointless criticism is, how everything a critic does is forgotten, how no one pays attention, answer. The bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. I know it by heart. Question. He also says that the one area where a critic risks something is in the discovery and defense of the new. The new needs friends, he says, but that's a fairly limited brief, isn't it? The best you can hope for is to be a carnival barker for novelty, an accomplice in the puffing, accomplice in the puffing up of the next big thing. It's pathetic, really. Ego has worked his whole life at something that nobody cares about and that doesn't much matter. Answer. Yes, but there's quite a lot more behind that review, which is hardly the movie's only or final word on criticism. Ego is not pathetic, though he is undoubtedly shrouded in pathos. He is a lonely, his is a lonely vocation, exactly as lonely as Remy's, at least at first. And that's because, though one cooks and the other writes restaurant reviews, it is in essence the same vocation. Remy and Ego both devote themselves, for reasons neither one entirely understands, but in ways that seem innate and involuntary, to the especially intense appreciation of something everyone else either takes for granted or enjoys in, casual, in a casual, undisciplined way. Food. This places them at odds with other members of their respective omnivorous species. Remy is driven from his rat family when his culinary ambitions put them in danger. Before that, he tries to educate his brother Emile, who, like the other rats, eats whatever is in front of him in the higher registers of flavor. Mere nourishment, Remy tries to explain, may be biologically sufficient to keep our bodies going, but there is so much more to our biologically bounded lives than mere survival. Remy, in other words, shows that the artistic impulse can be present even in the meanest subsistence-driven circumstances. Indeed, that it has to be there if it is to exist anywhere. He further shows that the artistic vocation is born in a critical, a comparative, discriminating, novelty-seeking engagement with the environment. He transforms the given into the special. If Remy starts at the bottom of the food chain, Ego, when we meet him, dwells at the top but he is no less lonely and misunderstood. He is fortunate enough to live in Paris, the world capital of gastronomy, and also, not coincidentally, of an ideal culture that fuses intellectual discipline with a devotion to the pursuit of pleasure. But Paris in this movie, as in real life, is harassed by consumerism, threatened by a vulgar, cheapening mode of commerce embodied by Skinner, the bad chef who nearly destroys the legacy of Gusto. The shallow customers who are happy to eat the branded swill he serves are his conspirators in culinary corruption. So together, even before their fateful meeting, Ego and Remy are united in a project that the rest of the world can only dimly comprehend, but that is nonetheless vital to the world's progress. Remy may think that pleasing Ego will help him realize his professional ambitions, but what he requires more deeply is the recognition of a like-minded soul. That is precisely what Ego needs from Remy. His love of food has been so frequently and thoroughly disappointed that it has nearly withered into cynicism. This is a moral danger, a danger to morale and to decency, that many of us face as we age. Nostalgia is part of it. Some portion of our formative experience takes on the status either of a lost Eden or a receding utopian ideal. As reality keeps letting us down, a vital source of inner critical energy is lost. 
question. By vital source, you mean a pre-critical capacity for simple delight, the ability to be moved without thinking? Answer, exactly. When Ego tastes Remy's ratatouille, he is transported back to that primal scene. For him, the dish evokes a highly specific complex of emotions. They can't be explained or even narrated, but are rather rendered through a kind of wordless, deeply emotional montage that is something of a Pixar hallmark. Through those images, we know the pain of the boy, little Anton, who fell off his bike, and also the maternal solicitude that eased it in the form of Madame Ego's ratatouille. Question. But really, what kind of mother comforts her child with stewed eggplants? Answer. A French one. And also the mother of, of a future food critic. As Remy well knows, the rustic simplicity of ratatouille belies its technical sophistication. You have probably eaten, or more likely, politely left uneaten, your share of mediocre, too sweet, tomatoey sludge sitting alongside a drab piece of chicken or lamb at God knows how many bad restaurants, or eating the stuff cold from a plastic tub while standing in front of the open refrigerator late at night. Question. That was caponata. Answer. Same difference most of the time. But if you read Julia Child's original ratatouille recipe in Mastering the Art of French Cooking, you will discover the key procedure that Madame Ego no doubt knew and that most lazy or hasty cooks ignore. It is essential to saute each vegetable separately in a prescribed order in the same olive oil before layering them for the final simmer. I say essential because the essence of each vegetable, onion, eggplant, tomato, zucchini, is surrendered to the fat and that sequencing of flavors is the key to the dish. It's not stewed vegetables, it's flavored oil. That oil is the medium and the meaning, the form and the content, the matter and the spirit. Question, you're losing control of your metaphors. Answer, I am, but let my exaggeration stand for the overwhelming nature of the experience, which our critic Anton Ego must somehow distill into words. Words that may not explicitly give voice to the experience, but, but that will subliminally connect it to the universe of public discourse so that venturesome palates will want to share in what he has discovered. And of course, that's just what happens. Question. Well, actually it isn't. When it's discovered that Ego has published a review praising a meal cooked by vermin, he loses his job and his reputation. His greatest act as a critic brings him ruin and disgrace. Answer. Which is exactly what every critic must be willing to risk at any time. The next phase of his career, by the way, makes literal a crucial aspect of the critic's role, which is to function as the artist's silent partner question. Yes, but he isn't a critic anymore. He's finished. He's returned to the pre or non-critical state of simple enjoyment. He's a patron in both senses of the word. The last time we see him, he's sipping wine with a smile on his face at Remy's new restaurant, as if he has been freed from all care, granted a new lease on life. Answer. He has attained an ideal state where there is not only no more criticism, but no more art. Remember what Gusteau says. Not everyone can cook, but a great cook can come from anywhere. I take this to be both an answer to and an elaboration on the insight that anchored Brad Bird's previous Pixar feature, The Incredibles. If everyone is special, that movie insisted, then no one is. In Gusto's version, everyone may theoretically have the ability to cook, but only a select few will have the luck or discipline to elevate that skill into the height of art. If Remy is one of those gastro-incredibles, then so too is Madame Ego, whose fame, as far as we know, is limited to her son's memory. What she and Gusto represent is a utopian dream, one that Remy and Ego turn into reality, that the boundary between art and life, and therefore the uncomfortably aligned, sometimes antagonistic roles of creator, consumer, and critic, will dissolve, along with the distinction between labor and pleasure. Question. That'll be the day. In the meantime, let's have a drink. Answer, if you'll pour, but we're far from done, there's a great more to discuss, a great deal more to discuss. Horizon of perfection is as far away as it has ever been, and therefore the work of criticism, properly understood, is endless. Nobody has even ever figured out where to begin or what to conclude. But in spite of that, a true critic is someone who knows, at long last, when to stop. <laughs>